Good morning. It was great to see you again. This is Grace Cavalieri with the poet and the poem from the Library of Congress on location. That's Maria Lacella with me. And we're going to have a time with her poetry and with her life and with her community work. And first, let's start with Maria and a poem. This is, um, I won't give any introduction, I'll just read it. Okay. Father, fix it, please. The dark befriends me here in the basement in your well-appointed workshop of able steel shelves, pegboards, bits. You could fix anything. TV and radio carcasses were respected in this room, not tossed. We're instead small engineering feats. You made me understand algebra and binary numbers in this laboratory. I try never to forget anything about you. Sometimes I lose your fragrance, but remember the crease in your starched white sleeve as you repaired a pen, a frame, a dining room chair. What book is that from, Maria? That is from Thieves and Family. I actually remember that poem. And yeah. family is a big theme in many of your books. Uh, would you agree with that? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, but I like to link it with other things. <laughs> no question. I mean, it's not yeah. all autobiographical at all. And you have three books out and we'll be finding out a little bit of each one of them perhaps. So Maria Lisella yeah. is a very active community worker in the literary world. And she has kept um, Italian Americans on the map <laughs> where <laughs> they could have faded away. So she's working as an editor and publisher, but we still want to hear another poem before we hear that. So let's have one more to get us started, Maria. Okay, this poem um, went through a couple of versions um, and it's now in this new anthology, Stronger Than Fear which is a terrific anthology. Um, Carol Alexander and Stephen Massimila edited it. It's called A Stitch In. It required a stitch or two, and so I tacked it the way my mother taught me. A seamstress in a different age, she'd tailor and sew and design in a union shop, a safe place. This shirt was sewn at a different time, halfway around the world. The two tabs stuck out of my friend's cheap striped shirt. Made in Bangladesh, read the label, where women who know nothing about raised fists of labor, United or the IWW or the AFL-CIO, sweat for 14 hours a day and 35 cents an hour, turning out shirts just like this one. The labels read H&M, Calvin Klein, Ann Taylor, Zara, Target, yet, when factories go up in flames or crumble into tangles of steel, concrete blocks, mortar, with detritus fizzling with the stench of human flesh and bone for weeks, maybe months in New Delhi, Bangladesh, Ahmedabad, label owners deny those very same women had anything to do with earning them the $2.4 trillion in profits they report each year on garments with tabs, untacked, seams unraveling. What a fabulous poem. There's an example of social action in poetry. I love that. It says everything we need to hear, Maria. And speaking of social action, um, you have been recently the Poet Laureate of Queens, New York, where you were born. Right. A native of Astoria, Queens. And um, you were Poet Laureate for how many years? Oh, I've been Poet Laureate since 2015. Wow. In a way, it's a bit of a gaffe because they should be choosing someone else, but they've had all kinds of rumblings in the borough president office and they haven't gotten their act together. Yes, I think- <laughs> People think it's a great honor when we're kept on as laureate, but it's just because it's too much trouble <laughs> to, somebody replace, else. to replace us. Well, I know you've been active because I've seen a lot of you on videos and giving workshops. Mm -hmm. Did you have any particular project? Um, the current project I'm working on actually is a book um, of my own, and it's called um, The Man with a Plan. It started off as a chapbook, and it's basically about my 
stepson. And um, I have two stepsons, both whom are mentally ill. And, um, but I decided to expand the book and include some of Gil's work, which is unpublished about his sons and his son's work because this child actually creates things and he memorizes them because he's also blind. So I just took his dictation and um, so I've created, I think it, it's a poetry collection, but it's more also a poetry exploration of mental illness in a family. This is the call to action you always answer. And um, I wanted to have everyone know a little bit more about Gil because I was lucky enough to know him and he was a pioneer in mental health, has recently left us. And um, I know you're still suffering from that, but what a great memorial to bring his sons to a place of honor. Yeah. And yeah, tell us just briefly who Gil was, his whole name. Yeah, well, his whole name was Gil Fagiani, and Fagiani means pheasants in Italian. So that became a bit of a theme be between us. And one of our first dates was walking through Woodland Cemetery because we had no money. So we, <laughs> we did a lot of free things. And the first date, there was a couple of two pheasants. It was a male and a female, and they walked by and he said, oh, that's a great omen. And I said, why? He said, well, because my last name means pheasants. You know, and so here we are in the middle of Woodlawn Cemetery, and which is where he's resting now. <laughs> so that's kind of funny thing. But he had an incredible life because he grew up in Connecticut, born in, born in California, raised a little bit in the Bronx, then went to Connecticut, uh, attended military college, then joined a, a Cornell University anti-poverty program in East Harlem, and that became one of his muses. Um, it was also a place of his downfall. Um, he got addicted to heroin. He entered a therapeutic program and that changed his life. Those 10 weeks changed his life. And that's a memoir that has just been um, accepted by Bordighetta Press. And yeah. that will be published in his own words? In his words, yeah. It's, um, it's called Boogaloo Barrio and it's 10 weeks that shook his world. From that, he, I believe he became the director of the mental health clinic in Queens, was it? No, he's, uh, he was, um, he directed uh, Project Renewal, which is in Fort Greene, Brooklyn. And he directed that for 21 years. Both of you have been on the forefront of our culture in literature and actually social action. So you are now um, a retired poet laureate and a new role as editor of VIA. Yeah, I'm the, I've stepped into Peter Covino's uh, spot as poetry editor. Have you started looking at manuscripts yet? I did, and I just handed in my first batch. <laughs> and uh, do we have any good people out there? I think so. I think we have a lot of good people. And I, and I think the Italian American scene has really grown exponentially in the last 25, 30 years. Um, um, the, you know, the writers are fantastic. Okay, and via, I'm just looking at poetry, but as Iowa, you know, we have people reading from every genre. So um, we have some novelists coming up, Mark Chabatari and George, um, Joe Giordano in September. So that's pretty fabulous that they just, they write about everything, just, but their names end in a vowel. I hear you. I hear you. If your name ends in a vowel, it's all good news for the magazine. <laughs> so let's have a poem, Maria Lisella. Okay. Um, this, this poem was recently accepted um, by Mom Egg Review, which has changed its name. This is called Fading Memory. She releases energy as if tugged by an invisible Shiroko. She sets aside her attempts to make room for binders labeled and dated to mark moments of clarity. When no one is looking, her hands run over notes on her calendar as if they were braille to pierce the fog of memory. The pads of her fingertips are animated. Soon they will reveal what day it is, the names of those most dear. Her son intervenes in odd ways, asking questions about her past, the places she once knew, 
It disturbs the gray reams of her mind in a world now peopled with Giacometti stick figures instead of humans with voices and breath. Is that about your stepson? Um, that's about my, no, that was about my mother-in-law who was losing her memory at the time. Oh, because I know that you uh, work yeah. with your stepson who is blind yeah. and um, have done heroic work there. So uh, this new book of yours is entitled what? It's going to be called The Man with a Plan. Right. And it's incorporating more than your voice. It yes, I'm going to- Three voices. Three voices. I don't know if anyone's going to want it because it has three voices in it. Um, but- Well, you know, mixed genre is the thing now. In Europe, right. this is all that has always incorporated many genres within one book and many voices within one book that were not an anthology. So mm. I feel this is right, very trendy of you. <laughs> and before we get more into your life, we want more and more poetry from La Maria mm. de okay. Sala. This is kind of a, this is one of my stepmom poems. Stepping. You let me, your stepmother, take your hand to walk into the surf. Let slippery seaweed wrap around your ankles like emerald ribbons. We step on the edge of lacy waves that feel like butter on hot skin. You hold back. Your mother's fear of the sea, fear of me, sways you. She warns you, Yemaya, the Santeria god, will swallow you into the sea here in Puerto Rico, La Isla Bonita, land of your Borinquen bloodline. I tip the balance. I study Santeria. I pin a benevolent picture of Yemaya on my bulletin board so we will know who she, so she will know who we are. Queen of, of, of the ocean, mother, Yemaya, savior of sailors, spirit of moonlight, she will protect you, I swear, as she does sailors in stormy seas. Tall, lean, and silvery drapery, she shows up in New Orleans hoodoo in Brazil, her wizened face a walnut. In Venezuela, I find a child-sized likeness of her, but I'm afraid to bring it home, its eyes too lifelike. Today, we are in Puerto Rico. We weave our fingers together, dig our toes into the sea floor, sandy and firm underfoot, and enter the sea of your ancestors. You know, I have never met a stepmother who entered the soul of her children as you did. Did you feel prepared for that task? Um, Yes, I did actually, uh, because the kids were pretty little when we were dating and I figured out the dynamic pretty quick, which is that I was often kind of miffed that I wasn't in the front of the line, but they were so little that I had to be on the back burner for a while. How and really? I accepted that because the kids were beautiful. They're beautiful kids. But you have raised them. It is clear that you have raised them and still do. What is the Puerto Rican connection? Um, their mother was Puerto Rican. So, and they look very Puerto Rican. They look very Caribbean. <laughs> um, but they do try to make peace with their Italian-ness also. <laughs> make, oh, I guess Gil helped with that. And you're going to be doing many more things. Are you going to continue with your workshops? Um, I'm hoping that the Queen's Library will continue some workshops and a small group emerged out of a series of workshops. So they, that group became Thursday Morning Poets. And Thursday Morning Poets is 14 women and one man. Um, and we meet every Thursday. We applied for a grant, which we received. And so we're doing a series of demonstration workshops right now. And we're all going to be at the New York City Poetry Festival. What is it? What is a demonstration workshop? Well, it's kind of it's to show them what it looks like, but also they in, interactive. We start off with a reading to to show them this is the kind of work that can come out of a workshop. Is it for an audience? Yes, it is. And then we give them prompts, and they write, and they are. It's an option to share or not share. Uh, and so we just started the series yesterday and we have two more to go. You're the leader. Um, I'm not the leader of all of them. In fact, what we decided was, uh, I feel that some of these workshops are really set up to help people empower themselves. And so 
when the Thursday Morning Poets um, began, they asked me if I wanted to lead the group. And I said, no, I said, you all know how it works. I think the idea is to rotate the leadership every week. And that's what they do. And everyone has been incredible with the things that they have brought in from speculative poetry to um, finding poems that were unfinished online and finishing them, all kinds of creative ways of dealing with writing. And they're, they're really an amazing group. It is very fulfilling for you, isn't it? Yeah, it's really great. We're gonna have a poetry break now. Okay. Better than a commercial break. This is, um, this is one of those pieces that I've done um, when I've been on a trip for my um, travel magazine that I've worked for. And uh, one of those outtakes. So this was from a, a trip in Rome. Love stuck. I jogged to the Borghese gardens, past the zoo's furless creatures, bound up the steps to Cardinal Scipione's Galleria, catch a glimpse of the Bernini sculptures, assuming their positions on pedestals, in time to gape at us studying them. They return breathless after a Bacchanalian feast, careful not to stain their marble bodies with blood-rich wine. I imagine Apollo rushing Daphne, who will never be caught in her desire to, taste, to stay pure and free. Like nosy neighbors, the figures follow the drama, follow their head, throw their heads back, recall yesterday's spectators peering up Apollo's crotch, wrapped now by Daphne's fingers, metamorphosed into laurel leaves that clutch the warmest part of his smooth marble body, staking her claim forever. Ah, what a sensual, what a sensual poem. You went to 63 countries in your yeah, career? Something like that. Something like that. Yeah. And it, you started a travel and leisure. Right, and then I went to a trade magazine, which, you know, travel and leisure people thought it was kind of a step down, but in fact, it wasn't. Um, it was a step open. Uh, it was called Travel Agent Magazine. And now I write for other magazines online, never traveling and Jerusalem Post sometimes. But you did not go anywhere during COVID? Uh, not much. Uh, I went, the last trip I had taken was up in 2019 to Calabria for a diaspora program that Maria Gillen was um, one of the teachers of. And then this year, I finally went to Prague and, and France. Just Prague and France. Prague well, don't and miss France. Trenton. Don't miss <laughs> Trenton on your travels. Many people do. Maria Lisella, do you think you've lived a wonderful life? Oh, absolutely. Why? I mean, a part, well, because, um, first of all, I was very lucky to have great parents. And um, I also had, I also managed to, I, I did sort of three smart things that I think affect your life. Um, I bought the right apartment. I found the right man. And I, and I said yes to the right job. Um, and that I always had a job that I loved. Uh, and I know a lot of people say, oh, no one, few people can say that. But I had a job where I would sit in front of a computer and I would write every day and I'd say, I can't believe someone pays me to do this. This is amazing. <laughs> this is like going to play and sitting next to some of your best friends who are doing the same thing. And we would be like, and at any time anybody wanted us to um, take a step up and become managers, we would just say, oh, absolutely not. <laughs> So we weren't seen as very ambitious people, but we were so happy in our jobs. You know, that and is my husband was like the best match for me. I mean, we brought out the best in each other. This so. is interesting. There is a saying that happiness is having a job which, where you are very good at it. And so you have to be good at your job to really enjoy it. This is true. And, you know, and in journalism, you know, you work with really intelligent people. And so that's wonderful to be with smart people all the time. <laughs> and know, speak, and let's have some fun. fun. <laughs> let's have some smart poetry, Maria um, Mastisella. Okay, um, I'm going to give you another. Um, I want to give you another travel 
piece. And the reason I wanna give you this one, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is because this is the kind of outtake where someone talks to me late after they've done their job with us, taking the press around and doing, you know, reading their scripts. And then you have to, I ask maybe one or two questions and they tell you everything. And I think they tell you everything because they expect never to see you again. Oh, so you're saying you do your job for the travel magazine, but after hours, you sit down with the individuals privately. Yep. If they have time and they're, they're interested, I'll sit with, you know, um, a clerk at a hotel or a guide, you know, anyone who's been part of this whole tourism experience. So this is called Mad with Fear. She stands alone atop Dubrovnik's bleached white fortress overlooking the turquoise Adriatic. The dry Bura wind brushes the heat of spring sun over her skin. A wind only nature could invent and usually saves for winter. Franitsa moved to the old city, a safe and ancient place protected by tall, thick limestone walls. Not for a moment did we think they would bomb the old town. Not Napoleon, not even Hitler did such a thing. When the bombs fell in the shelling hours, we slept sometimes for 16 hours a day. I have never slept so many hours, so much of my life just sleeping. Sometimes when we woke, we could not hear, we could not speak. Her, fit, her pale, wide-spaced eyes sag at the outer corners, and I wonder if they looked that way before the war, before the shelling, before the long sleeps, before sharing five liters of water each day among so many who needed to drink or bathe. With head erect, she returns to the guide's pose. Her spine arched, fierce as a bow, she faces her subject, speaks past me, telling me the story to a new audience. At night, we tied our wrists one to another so we could not be lost. Her head lifts, her eyes lock on mine as if for the first time. And we laughed for no reason, mad with fear. You, what can't, make you can't make it up. <laughs> what country was that, Maria? Croatia. And that is in the voice of the young guide? Yes, that's mostly in the voice of the young guide. You know, those, you can't really fictionalize something like that. The terror <laughs> is in the lines, isn't it? How many outtakes do you have to your credit? Um, I have quite a few, actually. Is I, that a book? It isn't a book. It's a book that Gil always said I should make a book, but I haven't. <laughs> I mean, how, do you have 20, 30? Um, I might have about 20. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I might have about 20. So it could be a small book. Yeah, but interwoven could be your own commentaries between, yeah. I, I just want to give you more work. You don't have enough work. No, that sounds I'm worried good. about but, you. you. Know, it's good. It's good to have work. It's good to have <laughs> work that you love. Work That's is holy. Good. You know, St. Aquinas said we were only promised labor. And I think those of us who love our work are so blessed. Very lucky. Because that's all we have is labor, really, all of us. So uh, give us another poem because we are into it. Maria Lacella, she is the author of three books, The Outgoing Poet Laureate of Queens in New York, where she was born and bred and has mem memorialized actually in her work. Um, tell us about your neighborhood again. There were two white, three white families in an African-American neighborhood, right? Yeah, we were in, um... Actually, we were, I started off in South Jamaica um, and it's in the Southeast section of Queens, which to me is pretty forgotten. Hmm. And interestingly, one of my yoga mates lives in, I guess that's St. Albans or Cambria Heights, which is sort of the step up next door. Um, so it's kind of fun because going back home. Um, yeah, there were two, two Italian families that were left. Um, Italians tend to stay behind for a long time. And the, the beauty of the neighborhood really was that we were all of the same class. And that was my first, I guess that was my, um, my education in terms of class, that class was more important than your ethnic background or your color or your religion. And so it was a very peaceful neighborhood. Um, what a powerful were, remark, what a powerful remark. 
about so, class. Yeah, and that does equalize everything, doesn't it? It does, much, much more than anything else. And you have a great poem about your, your best friend and you wished who was African-American and you wish you had the same hairstyle. So. Right, I used to ask my mother to, to give me cornrows. <laughs> okay, Maria Lissella, hit us up with another poem. Okay. Um, this, this is a little bit, this might be a little bit disturbing. It's, it was in New Verse News and it is about um, the having to deal with mental illness. The call, the call came, a, th a three-story roof, not a big building, serious enough to break bones. A day later, another call comes, a room at Jacoby. I plan, he drives, I'm the passenger. She'll be there, you know. I know, I hear myself say, the mother is always there. I hate the stereotype, but it fits. The mother takes him back, he doesn't get better, he never leaves except this way. The cycle, failure, salvation, failure, a passive remote control, patched up, lateral moves, ward to ward, suicide watch. From the parameter I watch, stepmother, not blood, not natural, despair, respects, no borders, legal, illegal. You love what you touch, love more what touches you. Mm -hmm fabulous ending. Is that something that was personal to you or professional? That was personal. Mm. Yeah, it's true. The mother is always there. There's right. a cycle. Save the child cannot be saved. Yeah. You have a lot to say, don't you? Um, I think so. I don't know. New Yorkers always think they have a lot to say. <laughs> really, you're a true New Yorker. You have a history in your bones and a history on the page. And so what's up for you that is new and exciting in your future? That's a good question. I'm, I'm still finishing Gil's last, his most recent book, a bilingual collection of his work. So that's, that's my last thing for Gil for a little while because he left four manuscripts behind. Oh, yes. I know. <laughs> But, I really feel compelled to do all of them, but I know which ones he wants. Um, my next big thing is to do the, um, to get this book out, The Man with the Plan. And the next thing was something that I had suggested years ago, and you said, go and do it. And that is to do an anthology of step parenting in poetry. Because when I started talking about it, a number of people actually came to me and said, I have a poem, I oh. have a piece. So I collected all these names and I put them in kind of a little corner and thought, you know, I have to do that one day because- Well, nice. you have between two and three in the morning. Let's not waste it, okay? <laughs> no, that is fabulous. I don't think I've ever heard of one like that. A stepmother's anthology. There could be so much uplifting about that and angst and common problems, sure. but that will speak to Oh, you have a you have buyers lined up around the block for that one. With the you know, with blended families that are so prevalent now, every you know, there has to be an overlap. Of people's response. when you were young, did you ever know anyone who was divorced? That's interesting. We had one cousin who divorced her husband, and um, it was really a big deal. <laughs> Such a big deal. I know. I'm telling you, that is the same okay. with me. It was Mrs. Conti, bless her heart. She was the talk of the town. <laughs> Poor well, Mrs. Conti. Louise, she was just gorgeous. And so, you know, it wasn't like a big surprise, but, you know. It and was now every other person I know has, as you call, a blended relationship, yeah. if, not a, if not a sexually uh, interesting one. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yes, these are interesting times, and we would love a final poem from Maria. Okay, um, I think I'm going to give you, I, I kind of like my what I want, but I'm going to give you a, a sort of new one. Um, here it is. And it's kind of a shortened version of this piece. It's called I think I called it interlude in the garage. Throw it all out. 
the photos, the papers, just toss it. Your words to my ears, but not my heart. Years later, I shuffle through the bloated banker boxes, piled, rearranged, but not gone, fat with promises, curses, copious notes on everyone you ever net, met, dreams, short stories, self-help clips, letters sent and unsent, projects in midair, saturated with energy, so palpable, it chases me out of the garage into safer places. The street, cafes, away from articles of the dead, from random places, cartons of words, 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 some of the light, some in the light, others in the dark, stumbling as I do over prickly discoveries, private journals I honor to no more than gla glance at, at stray words, dreading each time the door closes that I will be the last one out. Maria Lissella teaches us how to write. And this is the poet in the poem from the Library of Congress. The program is produced by Forest Woods Media Productions. Post-production by Mike Turpin, MET Studios. We wish to thank the Library of Congress for making the program possible. Funders are the Sinipid Fund, Natalie Canavore, and Sandy Jackson Cohen. I'm Grace Cavalieri. Our engineer is Mike Turpin. Thank you.